is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. You are Lord, and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. That's the word of the Lord. I would like us to focus on the goodness of the Lord this morning. The Bible says, and the fruit of the Spirit is goodness. And therefore it's good to focus on the goodness the goodness of the Lord, and the goodness that is required of us as Christians. I will borrow from the book of Psalm, chapter 23, because David is a person that we know in the Bible. It's a, he's a biblical personality that we know very well. We have interacted with him many times as we read the Bible, as we listen to Bible stories, as people share testimonies. David is one such person who comes out as a very, very strong uh, biblical personality. God said of him that he's a man after God's own heart. And so we have lessons to learn from David. David has experienced many things in his life. And the testimony he gives is, in all these things, the Lord is my shepherd. He doesn't even say, the Lord has been my shepherd. He has the confidence that the Lord is. And this is, is very strong because it gives a picture, and a testimony of a person who believes in something that is current. It's not about yesterday. It's not about days past. It is very current. The Lord is my shepherd. And then he goes on to say, what does this shepherd do to me? He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He guides me in paths of righteousness. And he protects me from evil. He has a rod and a staff that protect me. And we see many, many things that David say of God. And so Psalm 23 presents our Lord, our God, as a shepherd, as a caregiver, as a provider of all good things, as a protector, as one who affirms us. Because down there he says, this same God prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He anoints me, he anoints my head with oil, and he causes my cup to overflow. Now, this is the goodness of God, a God who affirms me even before my enemies. You, you also see a God who is very peculiar in his goodness because he does not wait until David is in trouble. David is so sure that he has a God who anticipates his troubles and therefore goes ahead of him. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He anticipates the troubles of David. This is the God that we are supposed to emulate. It is this kind of goodness that is expected of us, his children. When you see something is good, what comes to mind? When God creates the world and says, it's good. When you do some work and you congratulate yourself by saying, it's good. When you affirm a friend and say, he's good, she's good, a good child, a good church, a good elder, a good pastor, a good leader. 
what is it that comes to mind? When we talk and declare our God to be good, we are simply saying he is everything that he ought to be. When you say a friend is good, when you say, a ch say a, my child is good, that boy is good, that neighbor is good, you must have assessed many things. And in them you have seen everything that you expected of a neighbor. Then you declare them good. When we say God is good, we are saying whatever we expect of him is evident. Whatever we ought to see of our God is there. He's therefore a good God. We look at God, at his creation, and we say, yeah, this creation is good. It reflects a God who is good. What about us as his children? We are the family of God. We would say then, spiritually, we have the DNA of our God. And we should therefore reflect the goodness of God in everything we do. A person looking at us will therefore expect that everything that ought to be seen is in God is also reflected in us. And this concerns our, possibly our high moral standards. It could be actively practicing good works just as our God never ceases to be good. Just as we read, his mercies endure forever. Just as we read in Psalm 100 that his goodness endures forever. The same is expected of us as his children, as his family, that we will demonstrate the same kind of goodness. God is good. The Bible says, Jesus came and said, Yes, I affirm this. Once somebody said to, to Jesus, good teacher. And our Lord was not very happy. He said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And so we have a heavenly affirmation that God is good. Mark 10 and verse 18. And his goodness is portrayed in everything about God. Think about God. Associate him with anything. It will be good. Paul. Writing. To Timothy said. You know what? Everything that God created. Is good. You know when we read Genesis. We see this happening many times. God finishes the first day. And he is happy. He says it's good. The second day it's good. The third day, it's good. The last day, he says, it's even very good after creating man in his own image. But you see, here we have now the world affirming that goodness of God. And Timothy is told by Paul, everything God created is good. You look at all his works. The psalmist again says, how many are your works, O Lord? In wisdom, you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures and it continues. Still affirming the goodness of God. So, you and I Christians, how can we define goodness? When people look at us and finally say we are good, it is about how we act. It is about the things we love and the things we do. Micah chapter 6 and verse 8 reminds us that we should act justly all the time. We should be merciful all the time. And then it concludes to say that we must walk humbly with God. Now, when you do these things, it's a good summary of the goodness that is expected of you. Never forget to act justly. Whatever the situation Whoever you are acting towards, be just, be merciful, and in everything, be sure to walk humbly with God. When you walk humbly with God, then his goodness is reflected in you because you can only do the things that God has allowed. 
Then the psalmist again reminds us that our goodness is evidenced by our obedience to the law. The law of God, the just law of the land, the procedures that we set for ourselves. You know, like us Presbyterians, we have our own sets of procedures. They have been accepted by the Church of Jesus Christ. They are Bible-based. They are also allowed by the constitution of the land. And so, when we agree among ourselves that this is the way we should be, now, a good Presbyterian will be that Presbyterian who follows the procedures that we have all agreed upon. And that's why you realize when we are commissioning somebody to do anything within our church, we induct them and we remind them of what is expected of them. Not just as Christians generally, but also as Christians operating within our structures. So following the law, Psalm 37 and verse 27 says, Turn from evil and do good. That's about the law of the land. Then seek peace and pursue it. Sorry, that is Psalm 34 and verse 14. Seek peace and pursue it. Because as you do this, you are faithful to the law of the land. When you seek peace and pursue it, it is about your environment, the people you live with. And finally, they will say, this is a good person. Some, the psalmist says, turn from evil and do good. Then you will dwell in the Lord forever. There is a promise for those who do good. And if you read the definition of goodness to, by Paul, as portrayed in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, a text that we know that talks about love, Say so many things about love, what love is and what love is not. You see that in that outflow of love, the end result is the goodness of the person who lives in love with other people, who offers love, who provides love, who appreciates love. That is goodness. Goodness is putting aside our own will and pleasure so as to please our neighbors. Now, this is not very easy. You think of what makes me happy, what makes me so fulfilled, then you go to the extent of forfeiting that so that another person is happy. How much can we do that? Paul demonstrated this by saying, you know what? You may enjoy eating this and that, but for the sake of the weaker brother, you can forfeit it. You demonstrate some levels of goodness. He also said in Romans 15 and verse 2, each of you should please his neighbor for his good so that you can build him up. Some lessons for Christians are not easy because this particular text tells us we can live not just for ourselves, but for our neighbors as well. In fact, it says you can go to the extent of forgetting yourself as you please the neighbor. Now, these are not lessons that you'd put under an academic microscope and they go down very well. These can be things you understand only as a Christian who seek to do and demonstrate goodness. Goodness is expected even when we are talking of people who have control over us, people we are accountable to, people that we can call an authority to us. And this is demonstrated in Titus when Paul was writing to Christians who had converted into the faith, yet they were still slaves. And he said to them, you know, be fully trusted so that in every way, they, your masters, will make the, sorry, be fully trusted so that in every way, they will make the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive. Your master will be attracted to the goodness of God through your actions of faithfulness. So real goodness is consistent goodness. 
whether we are in our workplace, whether we are with our families, wherever we may be, goodness must be consistent. Then goodness as a fruit of the Spirit carries the idea of moral excellence. It belongs with righteousness and truth. How do you qualify a Christian to be good? Definitely you have to look at their morality, isn't it? If they have any integrity issues, they don't pass as very good Christians. If they are not truthful, again you can't say they are especially good. So goodness is a reflection of our Heavenly Father's character. And it must therefore be all round. We are representing God. We are Christ ambassadors. And in John, the third letter of John, we read, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. A parent, any parent would say this, I have no greater joy than this, that my children are walking in the truth. What about our God? He would not have greater joy than knowing that we, his children, are true ambassadors of Christ and that we are walking in truth and therefore portraying the goodness of God. goes on to say, dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is good is from God. Anyone who does what is evil has not seen God. Well, seeing here is in the act of experiencing God. Experiencing God to the extent that you allow him to have total control of your faculties. And so whatever you do, whatever you say, whatever you plot, whatever you conspire, is in line with the goodness of God. And if you conspire to do evil, then you have not even seen God. You have no claim to the faith and to being a member of the family of God. Practical goodness is expected of all of us. And it is expected as evidence of our transformation as Christians. Once we were people that were not. But with the salvation of Jesus Christ, we were transformed. And in this transformation, then the goodness of God is expected of us. There is goodness and there is good works. And true worship of God and good works must go together. We have always heard the text and the lesson of the salt and the light of the world. And people who are Christians, who are called by the name of God, they are expected to give taste to their world, to season it, to preserve it, and to spell out darkness as the light. So, if you are going to worship in truth, if you are going to be acceptable as true worshippers of God, then there has to be consistency between our worship and our actions so that our good works are truly the evidence of our worship. God has provided us with the scriptures so that they can thoroughly equip us for this. Once Paul wrote, and this was directed to Timothy, and he said to him, Son, you know, take care of the scriptures. Have them in mind always, because all scripture is the breath of God. They will teach, they will rebuke, they will correct, they will train. And finally he says, so that the man of God is thoroughly equipped for every good work. You know, you cannot neglect the scriptures. You cannot neglect the Bible and still be able to practically demonstrate the goodness of God expected of us. So, what is expected of you? What is expected of me? 
what would pass you and I as good in the eyes of people as we represent God. Let us know the character of God. Let us know his consistency. Let us know how much he loves mercy. And let us know how much he loves just actions. Let us know how much he desires that we will walk humbly with him. And finally, I just want to refer you to the bulletin. And it demonstrates so many characteristics of the goodness of God. See if that makes some sense to you. I think it's almost the last page in between there. There are many things that you will see. We call them the attributes. And these attributes are all lapped up to demonstrate the goodness of God. When God demonstrates love, what has he done? He has shown his goodness. When he gives us faith, when he gives us anything, it is an indicator. It is a sign of the goodness of God and what it is that he expects of us. Let us pray. God, we thank you for your goodness. Your goodness endures forever. Your goodness is what you expect, that it might be a reflection of our lives, O oh Father. We speak to other people and make an appeal to them and attract them to yourself by being as good as you are. Your servant prayed and said, God, may this goodness and mercy follow with me all the days of my life. And this morning, God, we want to own everything about your goodness that it may follow with us, that we might own it. And when we have it, it may cause others to know you, others to love you, and others to desire to be guided by Godly principles, the principles that causes goodness to be evident. We are not good. Only you, God, is good. But God, we want to be like you. More about you, teach us. More about you, help us to own. More about you, God, may we tell others because we are ourselves convicted. And now may your goodness and mercy follow with your people. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You jubilant in my hallelujah, one my shout.